started. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Well, good afternoon or good morning, depending on your time zone, everyone. Uh, welcome to the conversation, Teaching Online in Unusual Times, that's being hosted by the ACRL History Librarians Interest Group. So thank you so much for joining us today for what I hope will be a great conversation about instruction for the upcoming fall semester. My name is Caitlin Tanis. I am the History and Social Sciences Librarian at the University of Delaware, and I am the current convener of the History Librarians Interest Group. Um, I'm also with two other officers today from the History Librarians Interest Group, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Hi, uh, I'm Rebecca Lloyd. Um, I'm the, a Learning and Research Services Librarian at Temple University in Philadelphia and liaison to the History and Spanish departments there. And I am the incoming convener for the Interest Group. Hi, my name is Jessica Epstein. I am a reference librarian at the Atlanta University Center and uh, history, political science, international studies, urban studies, uh, and public administration are my areas. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, so some housekeeping to uh, just some housekeeping tips before we actually get going. Um, so as uh, you were informed, we will be recording this session and then um, anyone who has registered for the event will get a recording um, this week uh, with uh, uh, as well as the slides uh, that we have from the, the program today. Um, and it also will be posted on the ACRL website. So because we want this to be a conversation, we want to hear from you over the course of this discussion for the next hour. So if you would like to speak, you have a couple options. So you can either uh, type that, that you have a question or a comment in the chat and we will call on you in the order that it comes in. And then you can unmute yourself to speak. Um, you could also raise your hand and we will call on you from there. If you do not wish to speak today, that's totally fine. Um, you can post your comment or, or question within the chat. So I do want to preface this conversation that my cat is going to interrupt a lot, but also um, that this is meant to be a conversation. Um, so we are not saying that we have best practices. We are not saying that we know what we're talking about. Um, we are still going through the struggle of what's going to happen in online instruction in the fall. Uh, so we want to emphasize that this is just a discussion rather than a presentation. So we'll be sharing a little bit of our own experiences, what we're planning for the fall, um, some challenges that we've seen arise for ourselves, and then we also hope to hear from you about your experiences and what you're thinking for the fall as well. And with that, I'm going to ask if Rebecca could please uh, talk a little bit about what online instruction is actually going to look like in the fall at her institution. Sure, and based on what I know, which is subject to change every 10 minutes these days. Um, so, I mean, Temple University plans right now to have about 30% of their courses in person still, um, but the decision has been made in the library that all library instruction is going to be online. So whether the class is held in person or not, we will be doing our contribution to that course online. Um, and, you know, I think there are so many questions of what that's going to look like in terms of demand from instructors and faculty, um, amount that's going to be synchronous versus asynchronous, how to present to a, an in-person class remotely, how to encourage participation in a virtual session, all things that we're going to be chatting a little bit about today. Um, I will say typically I do a lot of instruction um, and I have not heard from many faculty yet. Uh, about class requests for the fall, I think because they don't know quite what they're doing yet either. Thank you, Jessica. Do you want to talk a little bit about what's happening with you? Sure. Um, so up until about nine days ago, um, our so so our university is a consortium, a library which services uh, Morehouse College, Spelman College. Uh, Clark Atlanta University and the Interdenominational Theological Center and uh, the Theological Center had determined to be online for the fall several months ago. The other institutions were prepared to have freshmen and sophomores on campus and offer uh, various modes of education for the fall, but last weekend uh, they decided to be all online for the fall. 
So I think instructors are still determining whether their individual classes will be synchronous or asynchronous, but, uh, but library instruction will be offered remotely. Thank you. Yeah, so as of Thursday, the University of Delaware has said that um, most of their classes are going to be online. Um, we're probably going to have about roughly 3,000 students that are going to be on campus in some form or fashion. Um, so that includes graduate students, but also um, uh, students that have or that are in departments um, that have hands on lab classes um, that need to have that in person experience. Um, as far as library instruction, we also have made the decision to do completely online uh, for the fall as well. Um, so that means either asynchronous or synchronous instruction. Um, we're trying to be creative and trying to come up with some other ideas um, and, and ways that we can connect with students and faculty. Um, and some of those I'll touch a little bit upon today. Um, but as of right now, we again don't really know what that library instruction is going to look like, what professors are going to actually want. Um, when we made the transition to go online in March, a lot of my instructors basically just axed the library session because that was the easiest thing that they could do. They felt like that was the easiest give that they could um, have to make room for their schedule for their course. Um, so I'm not quite sure what uh, my teaching load will be for the fall. So we'll see what, what happens with that. Okay, so now we're going to go to the first portion of our uh, course, or uh, not our course, our presentation today. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about asynchronous instruction videos. So we have um, a couple of questions that we've been asking ourselves um, for what this might look like for us specifically as history librarians for the fall. Um, and a couple of us have had experience uh, doing and recording asynchronous instruction videos. So we thought that we would just very briefly touch upon what that has looked like for ourselves. Um, would anyone like to go before I start speaking? Okay, I can, I can go. Um, so as I said, um, I did have a few instructors in the spring um, cancel class, and I did have a couple who decided that they wanted some asynchronous instruction videos, um, which ended up being a very big challenge for a variety of reasons. Um, I've never done any of this type of recording in the past, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, so I just kind of started playing around with some videos um, and some software that I could actually record that video through. Um, so what I've done and what's worked really well for me is I recorded um, a video through Zoom and then I kind of showed a PowerPoint presentation. I did some database demonstrations and then I was able to upload that video into a, a basically a movie editing software that I could kind of cut out the parts that I didn't like. Um, and I've been trying to find ways that I could replicate that again going forward. Um, to be honest, the first time that I did it, I did 20 minute videos, which is a no no um, for online instruction, especially asynchronous videos. Um, what you usually want to do, and this is coming from some uh, video designers that I uh, have the pleasure of working with at UD. Um, we they told me that I should keep it from one to two minutes and obviously 20 minutes is not <laughs> way over that line. Um, one to two minutes is the ideal. Um, you can probably have a max of about four to five minutes, but over anything over that students are not going to listen to you. Um, so because of that, you have to think strategically of what exactly you want to show within those videos. Um, so some of my colleagues and I have been thinking more about okay, what concepts do we want students to get instead of doing, you know, generic database demonstrations? What exactly do we want students to get out of our class um, that can be condensed in a little, a little setting? And then they could maybe approach us for further instruction or uh, further questions about specifically finding resources for the research project. Okay, I'm going to stop talking and, and leave room for for other comments. Hi, this is, is, is it okay if I talk? This is Erica Bridgeco. Do you want us to raise our hand, Caitlin? Go ahead, Erica, that's fine. Okay, uh, so I'm really interested to hear um, what you did, Caitlin, um, because over the summer, I also did a series of instructional videos and I used the, um, oh goodness, now I'm not gonna be able to think of it. Um, 
Oh, do you know the Bridezilla video where um, picking a topic is research? I can't remember what institution it comes from, but I use them as a model. Oh, you, I think NC State. Um, and also um, uh, a colleague sent some best practices, which, which basically was everything I would have not done. So like, I'm glad that they sent some best practices because I would have done longer video, the same kind of thing. Um, but I did end up doing scripts um, and I found that it was too much for me to do, um, to do speaking um, with, with a video on me, reading the script, doing the webcast like like so like if if i did have my face it, or if i do have my face present in the future i would do kind of multiple takes or something or do the web you know the tutorial um apart and i also um you know found that um stepping back and thinking about the skills i was trying to teach whether or not they were exactly what I would do in the regular classroom was important and actually was kind of liberating and, and exciting and interesting to think about these kind of skill based things. So yeah, I just wanted to uh, share my experience um, since it kind of dovetailed with yours. Yeah, thank you so much. And I, I think that's also having these skill based videos for students is a little bit more rewarding for them in terms of actual concept and skills that they can take and potentially apply elsewhere throughout their entire um, education. Um, so it doesn't necessarily, at least I feel it doesn't necessarily have to be specific only history skills. It can be larger information literacy skills that they could apply elsewhere. Um, and also I'm just very, I'm trying to do away with database demonstration videos because I find that students, especially when I'm giving them an instruction video, I doubt they're going to look at it. And also, they've been done in some cases by database vendors. So I'm a big proponent of not replicating things that already exist. So I'm going to borrow that from a database vendor. And I'm going to be like, you know what, if you don't know how to navigate this ProQuest database, okay, I'm going to send this to you. Um, or you can set up an individual consultation with me. Uh, Rebecca, did you have anything that you wanted to talk a little bit about? Um, I mean, I don't have too much that's distinct from others. Like I also recorded some videos over the summer. I tried to keep them brief. They were definitely too long. Um, it's very hard to get, a sh you know, I think you just have to be so clear on what your outcomes are, your desired outcome is, and then only do that. And I'm, I think that it is very challenging. Um, to keep them as short as they are. Erica, to your point, I also, I would not record, I did not do um, video. I just did audio with um, the screencast. I also think that's too much to manage all of those things at once. And it's also like you say, if you're gonna, I mean, multiple takes, gosh, that seems so time intensive unless it's something that can be used by multiple classes or many classes even. And, and I think that's the thing that I'm trying to figure out as well, thinking forward, um, you know, I'd love to do something on primary sources that's kind of both an introduction to primary sources for history, but then also skills for finding and navigating them, um, whether it be through library licensed content or freely available online content. But it's like, how do you make that generalizable to many different um, historical disciplines and kind of, you know, different course levels and skill levels. Uh, still trying to think that through. Um, I know here we have at Temple an instructional designer on the library staff who's, who's helping make more interactive tutorials, um, kind of like that Bridezilla type one, but even ones that have like, like, uh, you know, interactive questions and things that students have to answer. But those are very time intensive. And so, they're only doing kind of ones that have a very clear plan and, and clear kind of use cases. Um, and so it's balancing, again, like how much time to put into something relative to how useful it can be to students and how often it will be used. You know, I'll say even like the kind of, I thought not very professional videos that I did over the summer for some courses, um, the instructors think they're great, right? but the, do the students get much out of them? Uh, I, it's hard to tell, but that is also sometimes the quandary in our, our 
typical instruction, whether it's online or not. And so I don't, I don't know how to over, whether to overthink that or not. So there's a question in the chat, maybe for you, Caitlin, or, or for you, Erica. Um, so Stephen Knowlton is asking whether you can give some examples of a skill which can be introduced in, in a one or two minute video. Yeah, and we did have an answer um, to Stephen um, from Sarah uh, that said that she's done basic truncation and Boolean concepts coupled with an interactive um, async activity, um, which I have also um, been working on, not with my history courses, but with other courses um, that I teach that it's just kind of that basic, like a basic way how to operate a database, but then you also are, it's coupled with an activity that students can do on their own. Um, although I've been struggling with, you know, I have these activities that I specifically include in, in my usual courses, and then I can walk around and provide feedback for my students. Um, but I'm struggling with how to, per, how can you replicate that classroom interaction in a video? And I don't necessarily have an answer to this, and so I'm hoping I can get some ideas from, from all of you, you know, how to make these videos interactive. Um, but also to your point, Stephen, um, I also, or to your question, um, I, I specifically focus on the research process a lot. Um, that's how I actually structure my in-class courses. Um, my students, I don't, they just have no concept of what the historical research process is and then how they're supposed to blend together secondary and primary sources to create a cohesive argument. Um, so I actually created a video um, based on, on that skill um, because I think it's important. They just are, they're thinking of two different things and they aren't blending that together. I hope that answers your question, Stephen. Feel free to chime in. Um, and then we also have um, another chat from Clinton that says another example for history, um, currently working on a video for developing a keyword search strategy for historical newspapers. And he's trying to keep it very simple, which, yeah, do, do these concepts that you can apply that can be sent to students that hopefully they can take advantage of and actually um, use. Um, I will say that for my very, very long videos, I do not know if students watch the entire thing. Um, but I did have a number of students that emailed me and said how helpful they were um, and how they, it really helped them figure out how they were supposed to actually do their research. So um, maybe a longer video wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily hurt if you're having a hard time uh, coming up with small little condensed projects. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest takeaway is that you wouldn't want to record an entire 50 minute Zoom presentation for your students. Like that's just gonna be really off putting. Although I have a feeling some faculty are gonna do exactly that. Um, but you know, the, all the research and guidance is just don't do that. But yeah, if it's not something you can get down to two minutes, like that's, I think as Caitlin said, like there's some gray zone in there of like a little bit longer content that's still possibly gonna be watched in full. Um, but that it, you do have to think about it differently than just going into a class and presenting for, for 50 minutes with no interaction. Um, I'm curious, you know, if anybody's using like tools like LibWizard to kind of build, you know, we're, we're going to do a trial of it. Um, I don't have too much familiarity with it where you can like, you know, within a database or something like that, um, build in like some questions and things sort of pop ups that students kind of have to navigate through um, that you could send to them like as a web address. Uh, through a web address that they could do as an activity in, as opposed to recording some sort of a video. Um, that's something I'm thinking about for the fall. I'm curious if anybody has experiences with that or kind of other sort of different options besides just recording a screencast. Okay. So Carolyn says they're also exploring LibWizard at Gettysburg. I'm sorry, somebody says they're using H5P. I'm not familiar with that. Anybody else know what that is? Sarah? Hi, that was me. <laughs> uh, 
Um, H5P is a really neat um, browser-based program where you can create interactive modules using a combination of short little quizzes. You can embed videos. You can embed quizzes into videos, all these things. There's a paid version, um, but there are, are ways to use it for free if you host it on something like WordPress. Um, UCLA has really amazing examples of their research tutorials where they use H5P. I can drop a link in the chat. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. That sounds really interesting. Not one that I'm familiar with. And then it does, I've got a few other people that have commented that they have been using LibWizard successfully. Um, and here's an example link um, from Gettysburg. And then, yeah, Screencast-O-Matic is another tool. Um, so that's great. I mean, I think, yeah, a big part of it is like, what are the available tools? How user-friendly are they? And then kind of what are your aims for the, the instruction and kind of how to blend those together as best as you can. Well, do we have any additional comments on asynchronous um, videos? And otherwise, we will uh, move on to synchronous instruction. Just want to make sure that we're sticking with the time. Um, Erica also commented in the chat that she did a series of videos for visiting undergraduate scholars this summer with the goal of introducing them to our library systems and how to do remote research. I did things like tutorials on how to find books and articles as a way to teach things, like how to effectively search, which is great. Would anyone else like to speak? Um, you're, feel free to unmute yourselves um, and, and talk a little bit about what you were thinking in terms of asynchronous instruction. Okay, I'm gonna let the, the chat uh, conversation continue and then we'll, we'll switch to uh, synchronous instruction videos. Um, and again, these are some guiding questions that we've thought of um, here on the screen. Um, and I'm going to ask um, Rebecca or Jessica to start us off with this one. Uh, sure. So I can talk for a minute. Um, Caitlin, do you have the slides, those photo slides? Do you mind queuing um, those I, up? I do not have, I've, I have one I've related to the digital um, integrity, is that what you were talking about earlier? No, well, there was like a, a short little PowerPoint with, with like five, four or five photo slides that I had emailed you. I don't know if you have that. Um, let me stop sharing my screen and grab that. I'm sorry, I did not see no, that. No, that's fine. Sorry about that. Uh, so, so while Caitlin is working on pulling that up, what, what it's going to be is, um, so the assistant head of archives at our institution, when she does archival instruction, she often presents students with a collection of photos from our archival collection. So, um, and this can be done, you know, if you're, if you're offering instruction remotely as well. So she shows students usually five or six photos that are all from the university archives and then asks the students to try to put them in chronological order using various visual cues from the photos themselves. So clothing styles, hairstyles, um, you know, whether the photos are, are in black and white or color and, and other things like that. So I pulled together a few photos from the Library of Congress public domain, um, just to give you an example of the type of thing that, that you could do if you wanted to engage students in primary source um, instruction. So, um, Caitlin, did you track those down? Should I try to share my screen? Yeah, why don't you just go ahead and share your screen? Because I'm not, I'm not seeing it in my email for some reason. No, that's fine. Um, okay, so let me pull that up. Okay. Is everybody seeing that? Yep, you're good, Jessica. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so yeah, so as I said, these are all from the Library of Cong Congress public domain collection, uh, and the link below there is specifically to their motion picture theater photos. 
Um, so I have four photos here that you can look at. I have not put them in chronological order. Um, but so you can see this first photo here. Uh, we'll, I'll go through them all really quickly and then we'll, we'll go back for a minute uh, and look at them. So here's the second photo just of a, of a drive-in theater, which is closed for the season. Then this third photo. And then this is the last photo. And so, you know, you could, you could give as much, you know, direction to students ahead of time as you wanted to or as little. Um, th these particular photos all have some visual clues in them. Uh, so this photo obviously is in black and white. Uh, you can also see in the foreground at the bottom right corner, there is uh, a little like placard indicating what movie is showing in the theater, which is the Philadelphia story. Um, so that came out in 1941. So that, you know, if students have a, a sense of, you know, who Cary Grant and Katherine Hepburn were, that that might be a clue. Um, you can also see this is a segregated movie theater on the south side of Chicago. Um, so that will also give you a key, a, you know, a clue as to the time frame. This next photo, again, you've got some movie titles on the reader boards. So, uh, you know, if, if you have a sense of, um, you know, when Platoon maybe came out, that will help you date it. And again, the students don't need to know the exact date. Obviously, they're just trying to, um, you know, place the photos in relation to one another. So then the third photo, as opposed to being in black and white or color, is in sepia. Um, so if students have any experience or knowledge about photography, they might know that, that this is presumably the oldest photo. You can see the, the you know, young child in the foreground uh, is, a, is a newspaper hawker or a newsie. Um, so, so that's got a particular time frame to it. And the board behind him indicates that the price of admission is one cent. So, so there's another clue. So this is, this is definitely the oldest photo. It happens to be from 1910. Uh, and then this last photo is uh, of what at the time is Grauman's Chinese Theater in Los Angeles. And you can see behind the ticket booth and in the ticket booth, there are signs for Star Wars. Um, and so this, this photo is from 1977. Um, but so that's something, obviously you don't have to do movie theaters. You can do whatever kind of photos you want. Uh, I'm gonna unshare, Caitlin, if you wanna take the the screen share back. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's a, a really great idea. And it's also bringing to mind um, another Library of Congress activity um, that uh, is, has been used. I think it's primarily used with elementary school and middle school students, but I think it could be replicated um, just as effectively uh, with college students. Um, so you take an image um, and you are really zoomed in on that image at first and the students have to answer a series of questions based on just looking at that really zoomed in image. And then the next slide would be a little bit zoomed out and then you ask questions of how does that change the students understanding of what's going on in that photograph. Um, and then the last is the full image um, and students again will, will um, be asked a series of questions uh, for them to figure out, okay, like how does this change um, their perception of whatever event or whatever is happening in that photo. So the Library of Congress has some really great resources to take advantage of. Does anyone have anything else that they would like to talk about? Rebecca, I know you've been kind of mulling some questions over for the fall. Yeah, and Caitlin, if you want to put this question back up on the slide, you can. Um, yeah, I mean, I have already gotten a few requests to do synchronous um, online workshops, like I said, I haven't heard from many faculty, but those that I have heard from, they're teaching their classes synchronously um, and they want me to come in, you know, virtually and do something. Uh, our institution's using Zoom. Um, and, you know, when I reached out to this faculty member, like, so, you know, do you have something in mind? Like, how would you like me to, you know, kind of structure things? So they're like, oh, well, exactly like you did in person was great. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, <laughs> well, Maybe, maybe not. Um, and so, so kind of thinking of how to somewhat replicate an in-class experience that, that the faculty member was satisfied with, but to try to create some more interactive component um, to make it more engaging 
um, in an online forum. You know, I mean, simple things I can think of are like adding poll questions at the very least uh, right into to Zoom. I know that's doable. Um, you know, possibly using something like Slido, uh, which is another way to, you know, create kind of some, some um, either multiple choice or open-ended questions that students can respond to and then display the results um, in the slides. Uh, that's another tool that I know some colleagues have used um, that I'm thinking about. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you all sort of how many of you are, are expecting or likely to do kind of synchronous workshops um, and, and what those, you know, what you're kind of thinking of the challenges. I mean, I do just sort of see you know, we all, gosh, all know how draining it can be um, to have to like kind of fully engage all the time in an online session. Um, I know from past experience, like students often do not really want to be, to show their, um, their image on the camera, uh, which is absolutely fine, but then it makes it even harder to sort of create sort of an atmosphere of, of, um, of people actually interacting and feeling like they're part of something um, rather than just recording a workshop that they watched later, right? Um, and so, yeah, so it looks like some others have also been asked to do synchronous. Um, so something we all are thinking about. So I think maybe I'll throw in also the, and Caitlin might comment on this sort of breakout rooms, right? So I know, um, depending on the size of your class, right, that, you know, you, it's quite possibly too, too large to have like a, a less structured um, discussion or to let the students sort of freely respond um, audibly. And so then the question of like breakout rooms and maybe each breakout room has like a particular theme or question or something to address, but like how are, how are students going to kind of interact and engage? How comfortable are they going to be in that environment? I, you know, know that in terms of our kind of own just library staff presentations and workshops that we have to do kind of like a a warning, like there will be breakout rooms <laughs> because people are so kind of done with them that they may not participate as a result. And so I'm not sure if uh, students feel that way, but I know Caitlin had a positive experience using a breakout room. She wanted to chat about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll share uh, the experience real quick and then I'm gonna um, call on Caroline or Caroline um, uh, to help, I apologize for mispronouncing your name, um, to speak a little bit about her comment that she wrote in the chat. Um, so I, I had two synchronous sessions um, in the spring um, and I, I tried using breakout sessions for both of them. Um, the first one I tried to give students, I was calling it a sanity break. because I felt like they missed that in-person interaction um, so I kind of shoved them into uh, breakout rooms just for about five minutes, just because I thought I thought they wanted to have someone to vent to. <laughs> um, they seemed to really enjoy it, um, but uh, it was again only for a short period of time. Um, and then I did it again for another class, but I think the reason why it worked so well for that class was because I had two professors in that space at that same time. So I was able to put the professors and then myself in the three breakout rooms that we had so that we were able to kind of lead the conversation within them. Um, so that's kind of sparked a question of, well, should I have one of my colleagues be in a classroom setting with me to at least help facilitate some of those conversations that I can't necessarily be in um, because I'm in another room or I'm talking to a student um, so I have been thinking about pairing up um, with other colleagues, but of course that's that's a lot to ask of someone of both of their time and also the prep work for that. Um, Caroline, would you like to Caroline, would you like to speak um, about your comment that you posted? Thanks. Uh, so at Gettysburg College, um, we do have really strong relationships with our faculty members in terms of prepping for classes. And what I've been really relieved about so far is that faculty members have been reaching out to us about how to take what had been an in-person experience and adapt it to an online experience. Um, I just had a faculty member though for the history of the book class who actually asked if she could record her own uh, description of one of our first editions. Uh, her logic was that she thought the students would actually pay closer attention if it was still the faculty member um, talking about the object. And in this particular case, I think it's a great direction to go. Um, the way we're going to do it, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, our, our systems librarian has provided us with a GoPro camera. 
And we can actually broadcast out of our space, um, either synchronous, so while a class visit is going on. Uh, now, in this case, of course, the faculty member would be with the class. <laughs> um, so it wouldn't work quite as, as keenly there. But what we're hoping is that because the GoPro camera and the, um, we've got a, like a bumblebee mic, make it possible for us to actually work our way around our display table, that we can um, basically introduce the pieces physically and then have the faculty member either recorded or then take up the description of the piece. Is anyone else pairing with a faculty member in that style? Um, I'd love any tips or any recommendations on how to keep the faculty member to a, you know, to a time. Um, to make it clear, you know, how much time would be helpful. Um, so any tips at all? Oh, thank you, David. Excellent. So again, um, I'm, I'll, I'll unmute now, but if anyone is in that similar situation of actually having the technology piece now, and so folks know we have the GoPro camera, <laughs> so now we're getting asked actually for um, opportunities for them to speak on pieces. Hey, this is Miriam from Ohio University. Um, and sort of relatedly, I have faculty who, um, who weren't comfortable being on the camera. And so they've written a script and asked me to create the video using their script, um, which I'm actually more comfortable with than having them, you know, come in, for example, or um, working with the materials themselves. Um, and so this is um, a script that go, will go along with material in our digital archive. Um, and I just received the script today, so I haven't actually delved into how I'm going to do it. Um, my main issue is like, you know, I want to properly attribute that it's their content and not mine, even though the digital images are ours. So I think that will just be kind of an introductory slide, um, just so that the students aren't confused about like, you know, who they're getting the content from, I guess. Um, but so that's, that's a sort of different approach that um, has just come up and I'm excited to delve into. Great. Well, thanks to both of you for sharing those interesting examples. Um, yeah, if anybody else has any comments or anything that you'd like to, to share regarding kind of thinking about synchronous instruction, I know one piece I'm, I haven't had a specific request for yet, but I imagine if Temple does continue to have 30% of classes online, or I'm sorry, in person, then there would be a scenario where like I'm remote, but the class is present um, on campus with the instructor. And so then I'm just like this talking head on the screen um, in the room, which is even worse, I feel like in some regards, because then you don't have any of the technology to do kind of I don't know, built in polls right in the chat. I guess you could still do slide presentations like Slido or Mentimeter or things like that to do some, some in interaction there. Um, but I feel like that's going to be an especially kind of strange environment because you're not going to have very clear views of any students' spaces or kind of any sense of sort of how things are going, um, even though they're still going to be, you know, physically present and sort of expecting a more traditional class, perhaps. Rebecca, if I may. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go yeah, ahead, Jesus. I, I'm, I'm Jesus from Yo Albany. Um, I don't do a, like um, individual sessions, like one time shot. I don't do that. I basically, information literacy and history is integrated with the program. So I have different sessions throughout the semester. And um, I do a lot of, um, Basically, students, uh, I do flip classroom, basically, that students do exercises before we meet. So what I, I've been starting to do is I have to convert my worksheets that were more like Word document or PDF into Google Forms. So students will have to fill out those worksheets in Google Forms before we meet. That will allow me to see where I can anticipate more where they have more problems and issues. And then at least in the class, in the synchronous class, we will have a context. It's not a starting out of the blue. And uh, with the flipped classroom model, it will allow me to at least start a conversation and the students will be hopefully sync with the conversation because they have been working on the worksheets. 
So let's see how, how it works. Yeah, no, that, that I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think I, I have some experiences as well where it's possible to get students to do some activities ahead or classes where I meet with them multiple times over the course of the semester. Um, and so there's a context for that too. Um, yeah, and then also Alicia shared kind of an interesting idea about having for specific breakout rooms, um, having either a Google Doc or Padlet form or something where the, the participants in that particular breakout group are sharing content there. Um, so it keeps them kind of on task and, and gives them a takeaway, um, hopefully as well, if it's you know, tied to their specific research topic or something. Few other comments here. Yeah, Google Slides for breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. Seems like everybody's got some great ideas of ways that we can kind of keep things, you know, more interactive. And it doesn't sound like anybody's totally anti breakout room. So that's, that's good to hear. It's so funny. Our library staff are. I don't know why. Great, so I'm gonna uh, move on to our next uh, slide, just in the interest of time. Um, so our next slide is just some ideas that um, the three of us have been mulling over um, in terms of offering uh, both faculty and students for the fall. And the first one um, is Jessica's idea. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Jessica. Sure, thanks, Caitlin. So um, <clears throat> several librarians on our staff uh, started about a month and a half ago taking a an online certificate course through Oregon State University in instructional design and so you know not not that I have any sort of earth-shattering tips to give you on instructional design quite yet since I'm one sixth of the way through the program but um, but you know one thing that we've been talking a lot about and I think it's particularly relevant in the remote online learning environment is to make sure, and this goes for librarians as well as instructors, and, and particularly if you are working um, directly with an instructor, like Jesus was talking about, this might be useful, um, which is to make sure that you are presenting material to students in a variety of modalities and allowing students potentially to respond in terms of, of feedback or coursework in a variety of modalities as well. So whether that means that readings are both offered as, you know, articles, but also potentially uh, there are videos, you know, if there's a TED talk or, or some other video that's relevant to student learning, uh, and then allowing students to respond to material either through text or through creating an infographic or creating a short video, just depending on what their you know, level of comfort with technology is and what their skill sets are. Yeah, and, and some of the other ideas that um, we were talking about and kind of throwing around, um, and I know that the, the second one has actually been implemented at, at my university. Um, so digital orientations and digital handshakes. So we we're trying to kind of create that connection that we had in person previously, but have that continue virtually. Um, so uh, one of my colleagues put together a digital orientation. Um, and then we also, each one of the subject librarians had to do a digital handshake is what we're calling it. So it basically was just a video, um, a headshot of us, uh, just very briefly talking about who we are, what we can do for them. Um, and we're hoping that this might make a personal connection the way that we do for faculty orientation or the way that we do for um, graduate students when we actually have that orientation of the library with them. Um, there, it, it definitely was interesting to me to try and to again condense a lot of information into a one minute video, um, but I'm, I'm hoping that that will at least um, put a face to the name. Hey Caitlin, what technology did you use for that? Did you use Zoom? I did, yeah. So I recorded myself on Zoom and then I edited um, the video in iMovie, um, which I know not everyone has access to iMovie, um, but I know that there are a couple other uh, softwares that you can edit um, uh, as well. So I think there's one that comes on Macs um, and uh, I'm blanking on the other one. Jessica, I remember I gave you a name of one software. I forget what it was. Do you remember what it was? I don't offhand, I can go through my email. 
I'll go through my email as well and then I can, okay. I can pop that into the chat. Sure. Um, and then I was just going to add also, so we've been working on a virtual tour as well um, of our library for incoming students. And uh, so we looked at a, a few different kinds of software. We looked at doing it through Google Tour Creator, um, which is very easy to use, but doesn't allow for the same amount of embedding as, as some softwares, which cost money. So ultimately we um, have gotten an annual subscription to ThingLink. And so that's what we are using for our virtual tour. Um, and I, you know, I've seen a demo of uh, Emory's Theology Library pits and Erica, I don't know, you might be able to speak to this more specifically, but um, they have a great virtual tour as well. And they use Matterport to create that. I can post the link to their virtual tour in the chat. Um, ours is not complete yet. So I, I don't have a link for our library yet. Yeah, I don't have anything to add, but yeah, they, they do great stuff. Uh, so a couple other ideas that we were also talking about um, were just some basic presentations for faculty um, and, you know, talking a little bit about um, doing some database demonstrations. And I was trying to alleviate a lot of me recording things over and over again and, and making, you know, 20 different videos. Um, so I started to reach out to some uh, vendors to actually see if they could talk to my faculty um, and of course I will be at that demonstration but it, it definitely does take a lot off of me um, and then I could follow up while well, I'm planning on following up um, with some specific um, points and tips that I want to add um, outside of that the, the database uh, demonstrations um, but uh, it, it's a way that at least we can connect to our faculty in a way that um, might help them kind of think a little bit deeper about how they can use um, these online resources and collections that we have at the library um, that maybe they didn't think about before and maybe they can bring that into their course. So I'm hoping that that might spark some, some ideas for them. Let's see. I can jump in and talk. I mean, we, one other thing we had thought a little bit about in terms of instruction or research consultations, um, whether it's undergraduates or graduate students or, or possibly even faculty, uh, you know, there it's a, a little bit different model of instruction, obviously, since usually it's just an individual or possibly a very small group working on a research project. Um, but th these are also, you know, certainly a big part of what a lot of us do and, and an instructional opportunity, of course, as well. Um, and so, you know, I'm kind of curious to hear if how maybe in the spring, um, kind of how your online research consultations went um, and if there, are, you know, were kind of any takeaways from that. I mean, I know we, you know, started, we had offered them before, but my, my experience was like almost nobody wanted to do it online prior to the pandemic. Um, because I do think, you know, oftentimes people did, if they were physically located in, in you know, near campus that they, they wanted to meet in person, but now that's not an option. So, um, and so, I mean, I, had, I definitely had a few consultations with undergrads and with grad students as well in the spring and early summer uh, using Zoom. Um, I think in that case, each of the students did share their video. I don't know whether they just like kind of felt compelled because it was one-on-one. -on -one. I certainly didn't you know, would would have been fine with them not doing so. But then, you know, I think, and this is something I think that's been talked about so much, um, is that then you're like getting kind of a glimpse into their their home life or wherever it is that they are currently residing um, in ways that, you know, you, you maybe are kind of glimpsing family members or sort of the, the limitations of their space or the problems with their bandwidth or things like that. Um, that, you know, are reflecting so much on why this is so hard for students right now. Um, and then sort of how to kind of keep focused on the, the research question or the, the need, the particular need that they have when they've contacted you while also being kind of attuned um, to other circumstances that you normally wouldn't be uh, in, in a face-to-face -face consultation. Um, you know, my sense was like a few students reached out 
uh, for consultations, but certainly far fewer than I typically meet with at that time of the year. Um, and so it'll be interesting, I think, to see in the fall when there is, you know, has been a lot more prep time and a lot more understanding of what research is going to look like, whether there are going to be more opportunities to, or, or more students reaching out um, for online consultations. Um, you know, besides just kind of sharing your screen and talking through it, like, is there any other kind of more creative way to, to work with those? Um, I mean, I certainly think that, you know, from the, the few that I did, like being able to share your screen um, and kind of helping them navigate particular parts of a database or a resource, um, rather than just talking at them, you know, certainly they found that valuable, it seemed. Uh, so that's at least an advantage of something that we can do online. Um, uh, any other, you know, thoughts or reflections on that um, piece of our role? I'm curious to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So David said that his online consultations worked well. That's good. Yeah. I, I didn't run into specific issues with them other than just a dramatic drop off in the, the quantity. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that will change in the future or not. Um, I've also been thinking about the possibility of having group consultations and maybe that will be less intimidating, uh, especially to undergraduate students. Um, that would require, I think, some cooperation with the faculty member. Um, but I've, I've been thinking about that and, you know, pairing students that have like-minded research topics together just so it, it's not on one student to come with questions um, and to, to ask what they're curious about. Um, so that might be another way uh, to reach students trying to do that general research consultation, but with a group. Um, I'm seeing some comments in the chat um, about uh, that, there, that research consultations created more of an intimacy, um, which is nice to hear, especially through, through a screen. Um, and that uh, several people give the option of giving a video or not, um, or sharing the screen, that it's never required, um, which is, I think, giving that option for students is, is really helpful to not force them to try and show their face in an environment that they might not want to. Um, I also am a little concerned about, you know, equity issues with research consultations that not every student has, you know, a solid internet connection that they could potentially do this. So maybe there's other ways that we can offer um, the same service that might not be through, you know, traditional email exchange. I'm wondering if anyone has ideas on that. Um, and I'm also going to just click to our last slide that are some additional questions that we were um, we had about some potential options for for the fall. And some of these we've already worked through. And again, I would in, in encourage people to unmute themselves and chime in. Yeah, a few other people shared some some kind of challenges or issues that they faced with consultations, um, screen sharing. Uh, issues with their um, computer crashing. So yeah, I've certainly, I think that takes a lot of memory and processing speed and, and, and bandwidth and all to do that. So there can be some issues there. Um, and also, yeah, someone connecting to like a Zoom call or Zoom session by a phone then means there's no option for, for screen sharing. So then that might be where you would just kind of talk through their question and then maybe follow up with either like a really brief like recorded you know, a uh, link to like a recording showing them some of the content that you talked about, or maybe just sending them some screenshots via email to follow up. But yeah, I think you just, you, as you were saying, Caitlin, about kind of equity issues, like you just never quite know um, where that student's going to be kind of coming from uh, in terms of their, their resources and, and capacities, um, digital capacities and things for, for these sessions. So you have to be mindful of that. Um, and yeah, if anybody wants to chime in about, you know, the questions we were kind of exploring for the fall or anything else um, that they might want to, to share. Um, I know I'm trying to think of like 
my, you know, usually near the beginning of the semester, I send my big outreach message of like, this is, you know, what I can do for you in terms of instruction, in terms of, you know, requesting materials and in terms of consultations. And I, I want to do that perhaps a little bit sooner this year, um, since a lot of this may be, you know, especially the instruction, instructional video tutorial piece will be more time consuming. Um, but, you know, kind of what, what specifically I'm going to offer even, I haven't quite decided. Um, anybody has any thoughts on that as well? Or other challenges? I'm just going to chime in real quickly and, and just briefly talk about um, how I've been partnering or attempting to partner <laughs> with uh, some colleagues of mine in special collections. Um, so uh, my, I'm a, in a separate department for re, uh, reference and instructional services. Um, so I've been trying to partner with my colleagues in special collections um, on how we can offer our resources in special collections digitally um, and potentially also how do the two of us you know, come into a classroom and have a conversation about the difference between online archival research and in-person archival research. And, and um, we're attempting to try and facilitate those conversations. Um, and we've reached out to faculty in the core research classes that we have, so Capstone, um, as well as the sophomore level research methods course to see if they would be interested in, you know, having two people come in um, and, you know, again, to generally talk about the research process, uh, generally talk about some resources um, that are relevant for their topic in class, but then also, you know, have this level of archival research um, added to it. Uh, so whether that be an actual collection that was digitized um, or whether that be just a conversation um, about what the limitations um, of online collections as well as how online collections can be helpful um, and can provide a lot of wealth uh, for your research. So that's something that I'm trying to figure out. Part of it is I need buy-in from the faculty, so we'll, I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> when any, does anyone have any general questions that don't actually apply to anything that we're currently um, talking about right now. I want this to be a, a place where you can chime in and, and ask generally if anyone has any advice for you. I'm seeing um, a comment uh, in the chat uh, that they're asking, um, Gettysburg College is asking faculty members to focus on learning goals for the session, um, which is a really great idea. Um, I'm wondering if you might want to chime in and just talk about how, because when I send faculty learning goals and learning objectives, all they say, like, I'm like, pick one, like, what, which, which one do you want to focus on? Or I list a, a number of them, they're like, all of them look great. They don't have any input. So I'm wondering how you're getting uh, faculty to focus on one specific goal. So um, this is Carolyn again. Um, one of the things that's worked really well is if they've already done an in-person session with us in the past, Mm -hmm. then we draw on that. So if the in-person experience was um, uh, early American documents of the colonial era. So the last visit, the importance was they got to see these colonial documents. Is your goal for them to know how to navigate our digital collection to see more of those documents? Or is it to actually talk about one of those documents in detail? And what we're trying to focus on is what's the most direct way for us to help your students, because what we're discovering is online, the time goes so fast. So if we have 115 World War II posters, in an in-class visit, we might have had you know, 60 of those posters available for students to page through. But if we just take one poster and have a Zoom session with breakout rooms and a Google Doc, we can get to the same end result but we're only using one visual and then the students can go to the digital collection and look for more. So what we're trying to do is have that springboard idea. What's the one object that could springboard your students into getting that end result that you were hoping for? Um, so that's how we've been doing it. So far I've had mostly faculty have already worked with us in the past and are eager to work with us again. Um, but keeping it very direct and having one object be a springboard or one skill to be the focus seems to be what they're interested in also. I 
I think Caitlin, we're about at time actually. So we are, yes. Um, so I'm gonna just click to our emails. Um, and if, if you wanna uh, talk to any of us or email any of us, um, please feel free to do so. Um, we just wanna make a very quick announcement um, that we do have a partnership and another webinar coming up in, on September 23rd with the Brusa History section. Um, Rebecca, would you mind just chiming in and talking very briefly about that? Uh, sure. Um, yes, it's going to be on, we'll send out more information. Um, it's going to be September 23rd uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern time, um, kind of bridging the past and present, I can't remember the exact title, it was about civic engagement in libraries, um, talking especially about kind of uh, in an election year, you know, encouraging voting and civic participation, um, both historically and, and contemporarily. Uh, and now we're looking at doing this in an online environment. So how do we do this kind of outreach and engagement with our library patrons? Um, so we're going to have three great presenters um, for that, that webinar and more details will be coming soon. Thank you all so much. Um, we really appreciate your conversation today and I hope that we can continue um, sharing ideas coming forward. And if you have any resources, please feel free to share with the History Librarians Interest Group listserv, which you all have access to. So thank you very much.